And for those who enjoy this channel and would love to support us financially, please feel free to hit that donate link. We'd greatly appreciate it. God bless. When it comes to the human ape similarity, they say it's about 99%, maybe 98. New incoming data suggests that it's more like 88% similar. That's 400 million DNA differences that separate apes and humans. Also the chimp genome is 12% larger than humans. So that helps separate us from, from chimps. These pseudo genes have been overturned. They ignore things like copy number variations. And of course there's huge gaps on human and chimp DNA. So let's get into it here. Uh, there exists though an unstoppable crisis for those that believe apes, humans, and banana plants are related through common ancestry. Now, this crisis is that of genomic degeneration. The evidence is absolutely overwhelming that mutations are accumulating and invisible to selection. So unfortunately for human evolution, both ape and human genomes are degenerating due to this mutation accumulation. This evidence is extremely strong. This strongly indicates that neither ape nor man could have evolved. They both must degenerate. In fact, many of the hominin fossils here clearly display anomalous pathologies that indicate that in the past, several isolated and inbred human populations have experienced reductive evolution. This goes for Homo neanderthal, Homo erectus, Homo naledi, the hobbits, of course. There is no progression. This type of reductive evolution has resulted in genetic pathologies, reduced body size, reduced brain size, and as a consequent, tribal extinction. This is expected given a biblical based model of post babel conditions and post babel dispersion. Genetic degeneration is a very real phenomenon occurring in living populations. If what we observe today in the present is reverse evolution and not forward evolution, the same thing would have happened in the past. And it is very well documented that what we truly observe in the hominin fossil record is genetic degeneration. For example, numerous of the bones of the alleged homo species like Hobbit, Erectus, Nalidi, Neanderthal, the ones that she used here in her opening, appear to demonstrate testimony of severe inbreeding and genetic decline. The so-called primitive features as a progression from ape to man is actually genetic degeneration. They weren't pre-human tribes. More accurately, they were human tribes that were persistently inbred and were in genetic decline. We can see here a paper actually that the claimed primitive humans are inbred subpopulations. This was a paper by Eric Trinkos. You can see it here. He's a paleo expert. And he noted that a total of 75 documented developmental abnormalities from 66 individuals spanning the Pleistocene. The author also explains that the remarkably high frequency of skeletal pathologies could not possibly be due to chance. This is exactly what we'd expect based on a post babel dispersion of isolation and, and subsequent inbreeding. The author suggests that these populations were almost certainly undergoing genetic degeneration due to inbreeding, as is expected in any small and isolated population. So these human variants, they all lived in isolation. And given the situations associated with each variant, the specific site settings would lead to these founder effects isolation and inbreeding. And what's funny is the author obviously doesn't conclude the biblical base model, but these findings and more strongly support the biblical base model of degeneration of small subpopulations, which is exactly what our model talks about. We got here uh, just recently, I believe it was in 2017. This negates all dating methods because we've got fossil footprints, anatomically modern human looking footprints that debunks human evolution in the same layers or lower than the Australopithecines. So anatomically modern human looking footprints have been discovered here in, uh, in Crete, I believe it's in, in Greece. They date approximately to 5.7 million years old. So these findings here are clear evidence that Lucy, Artipithecus, Australopithecus, Sediba, Homo habilis, etc. They're not our evolutionary ancestors. And the reason is because these footprints indicate that creatures with human feet lived much earlier than these so-called human ancestors. Genetics, genes, traits, these are what are inherited sperm and egg, not a rock, not geology, not geography, but genetics. So um, I think this article here on Evolution News puts it perfectly. They, they say, when the oldest known evidence for hominin feet predates the alleged African ancestors, such as Artie, 
and Lucy, but already shows relatively modern human footprints, what is more congruent with this new evidence when looked at without bias? A gradual Darwinian evolution, or rather a saltational origin that requires intelligent design. Just a few points here. Evidence from paleontology, archaeology, and modern genetics all irrefutably confirm that Neanderthals were in every way fully human. Erectus, for example, was able to sail, which clearly speaks of human intelligence. Homo floresiensis was also very clearly human, as indicated by their impressive cultural inventory, ability to sail, endocast scans that reveal a modern human brain, and anatomy that is modern human looking. Reduced brain sizes, for example, can be beneficial in certain conditions, such as starvation. This explains the, the smaller brain sizes that we do see in some of the hominins. This is because brains are energetically costly. This is all evolution in reverse, and these pathologies and variants can occur quickly in isolated populations. This is all expected and predicted in the biblical model post Babel and post flood. You know, before we even had DNA sequencing technology, it's quite obvious at the physiological level, humans and the great apes had a lot in common in terms of appearance, basic body structure, both mammals have binocular vision, etc. There's some major differences, of course, though. Just look at the feet of the great apes and the shape of their feet. They have feet that look like hands. They use these for grasping purposes, of course, swinging from trees, etc. Now, humans have feet, on the other hand, that are built for upright walking. We are similar in these areas, and therefore we should have similarities genetically as well. This should not surprise anybody, and this is in no way, shape, or form proof that humans, apes, and pine trees are related. Now, of course, evolutionists like to look at these similarities and imagine that all life forms are related, but this is not empirical. This is actually in the realm of fairy tale. The bigger question we are trying to answer is why are humans and great apes so similar? It doesn't matter whether we look at the anatomy, the physiology, the genetics. They all tell us that we are a lot more closer to each other than pine trees and dogs. Now, evolutionists will say the similarity genetically is, is the high 90s. It's just false. It's more like 88%. But regardless, we are pretty close. What does this tell us about our origins? The evolutionist seems to think to themselves that if we really are made in the image of God, shouldn't we as humans be distinct from the rest of biology? Well, maybe in a way, yes, but in another way, no. The Bible doesn't imply in any way that we have biological life and then human, which has absolutely no similarity to any other species out there. There is no reason for us to believe believe that based on a biblical model, there should be no type of hierarchy in the biological world. There's no reason to believe that we shouldn't be more similar to one species, for example, the apes, than to another species, for example, a wolf. Naturally, we as humans have designed things with groups within groups patterns. If you were to look at the types of vehicles or modes of transportation humans have created, they naturally form groups within groups patterns. A sedan has a tremendous amount of similarities with other sedans. Now, a semi-tractor trailer is obviously much different than a sedan or a car, but these two modes of transportation are similar enough to each other that it sets them apart from airplanes. This is the groups within groups patterns that emerges when we look at all the modes of vehicles or transportation that humans have designed. This is an empirical observation and this is something we naturally do it appears that god created kinds in the beginning that are different from us as humans as well as kinds of creatures that are more similar to us this is a reason why r and ra's phylogeny challenge is fallacious we too predict nested hierarchies morphology anatomically and genetically Evolutionists miss the bigger picture. Yes, we can find hierarchies in all of biological life, including humans and apes, but apes don't build airplanes, apes don't write books, apes don't compose symphonies. Chimpanzees and other animals don't do any of these things. Mankind has built the space shuttle and has accomplished wonders. So yes, there are groups within groups patterns in all of life, but this is simply a hallmark of design. The fact that there exist these natural and nested hierarchies is exactly what we'd expect if God created the world. We can see here, even if we got into transitional forms, we create things that blend the features of, of two different types of vehicles, amphibious assault vehicles, for example. We can see here that all the evidence regarding mitochondrial DNA, Y chromosome, the low genetic diversity that we see all points to Adam and Eve. Evolutionists need to ask themselves if they have an open mind and they were to look for evidence for Adam and Eve, what would they expect to find? Because all human beings are profoundly similar genetically, and this points directly to creation a Y chromosome of apes and man and how they're so dissimilar, less than 70%. The Y chromosome should be the most similar. 
for the decay rate according to catastrophic plate tectonics if, if rocks were exposed to heat and pressure this could speed it up heat from below the crust coming up to the ocean then to continents of course so volcanic activity hitting rocks worldwide uh, human chromosome 2 fusion well that purported fusion site's actually a functional dna element in a human gene so that's been overturned DNA analyses anyways confirm that the supposed homo species now all coexisted, intermingled and interbred. This is confirmation that they are all fully human. Even at Habilis, Sediba, there's there's so much evidence now, even some paleo experts are agreeing that these are classic examples of what happens when you piece together a so-called species based on a jumble of mixed bones. So what some evolutionists are saying are uh, your perfect transitional fossil from ape to man, it's actually a mixture of human and non-human bones. And they're, they're simply an artificial species, uh, a ghost uh, taxa. That's why Sediba, for example, Australopithecus Sediba, is described with anatomical contradictions. For example, upper limb and shoulder anatomy, just like arboreal dwelling orangutans. And then you've got hands indistinguishable from modern humans. And this isn't the first time this has happened. This has all happened before. Uh, for example, one that comes to mind is, regarding the mixing of human and ape bones has occurred in Piltdown Man. So, you know, which was just what they did. It was an ape jaw that was force fitted to a human skull. But unlike Habilis and Sediba, of course, I'm not saying Habilis and Sediba are a conspiracy by any means, but this was done intentionally while Habilis and Sediba, not so much. They share most of their features with living apes today. They're around three or four feet tall with long arms and short legs, ape hands and feet with long curved fingers and toes, opposable thumb like um, toes, ape size and ape shaped skulls, funnel shaped rib cages with high placed shoulders for suspensory behavior, which is why the best conclusion is that these were apes and nothing more than just an extinct ape genus. The fact that a bamboo bone was incorrectly assigned to Lucy for over 40 years, that doesn't really give me much confidence regarding the evolutionists and their many other conclusions on, on human origins. And I explain all the different species in the lead Neanderthal, Erectus, the hobbits, for example. These are all inbred subpopulations, explains all the degenerate features. Homo naledi, for example, explains the curved fingers. This is all expected after Babel, post Babel, post flood, isolation and inbreeding. Everybody disperses, a few unfortunate subpopulations migrate, remain isolated. We see this clearly. For all those who appreciate the work that we're doing here on Standing for Truth, please hit that subscribe button because we are just getting started.